Thank you. Hello, my name is Skyler. I'm a research scientist at IBM Research Africa. I've been here for about three and a half years, and I'm joined here today with some more research staff members uh, coming out for the workshop as well. I uh, have two different roles at the lab. One, I sit on a team called Financial Inclusion, where we try to increase access to financial services across the continent. And on the other role, we work on artificial intelligence and data science. And so this particular topic actually meets at both of those. I'm going to talk about uh, credit scoring, uh, which is, uh, again, a very relevant add-on to the conversation we just had before. going for it right now in East Africa due to mobile money. All right? We would like to be able to extend beyond these services into the more complicated ones and specifically looking to see how mobile phone data can help enable access to credit, insurance, and investments. All right? We're from IBM, so if we're talking to businesses, we'll use stats like this. Two to three billion people in the world or 200 million SMEs do not have access to these services. So there is a huge gap in order to offer these types of services. If you're more from the policy space, there is a specific uh, sustainable development goal about increasing the access of financial services for all. all right? So this is a problem recognized both in a commercial and more in a public space. We're coming at it from a data-centric point of view. In spe uh, more specifically, there is a mobile savings and loan product. So people can sign up for this product over their phone. They do not need a bank account. Uh, they do not need to step foot into a bank. They can just over their phone say, I would like to be able to save and borrow money using mobile money as the payment channel. We monitor these individuals for one month and determine whether or not they pay back a loan that was dispersed over that one month period of time. And roughly about three-fourths of the people repay those loans, and roughly one-fourth of the people default on at least one loan taken out in that first month. We would like to be able to do a better job predicting who's going to pay back these loans and who's going to default. The data that we had access to is actually collected six months prior to the customer signing up on the product. So when they sign up for the product, there's an, uh, an arrangement between the bank and the telco. The telco provides this data to the bank and this says this is how they've been using their phone. It includes things such as how much airtime they've used, mobile money transfers, uh, daily balances of airtime, and uh, if they've used airtime credit in the past. So we've got this data. We want to be able to use this to predict who's going to pay back or not. This is a very classic binary classification problem. We've got a bunch of nice numeric features, categorical and real valued, and we are trying to predict repay or default. Here's one of the examples of the features we have. How much mobile money was withdrawn in the six months prior to signing up for the product? And we've got two different ca classes here, those who repaid in blue and those who defaulted in red. So this is one of the features that has a fairly strong signal. The more money you take out in with mobile money withdrawals, the more likely you are to be able to repay a loan in the next uh, roughly six months. All right? So we processed this data using decision trees. And so I believe two years ago, was anyone here two years ago? Yes, so some of you guys, thought the first half of this should sound familiar from two years ago if you have been here. The second half is where we get into the transfer learning set. So we basically built a whole lot of decision trees. We use a process called boosting in order to increase the accuracy of predicting who's going to pay and who's going to default. Uh, in the original market, we were able to claim that we can reduce the default rate by 55%. That is, all, of all those who are going on to default, again, here in the red, if you draw a line in the sand, we can say 55% of these people would not be allowed on the product, and that exact same line would also allow 83% of the existing, payer, existing paying companies, customers, to stay on. All right, so this is a little win column for our first uh, rollout in the original market. But then the bank said, we would like to go into a new market, a new country. All right, this is important both for increasing their um, market growth, their market cap, as well as pushing financial inclusion. 
However, not only do they not have labeled examples of who's going to pay and who's going to default, they, don't even, they are not able to give us an example of what their customers look like in this mobile phone data set. So now this is the problem that we had to address. We want to roll out in a new market. We no longer have labeled examples, and we no longer have what we call the marginals. We no longer know what the actual features are of the customers who are going to sign up for this product in the future. All right, so I'm going to describe this using stick figures. All right, on the left, uh, the features are represented by the stick figure, and we have the labels paid or defaulted. However, in the new market, we do not know whether or not they paid or defaulted. All right, so originally I considered this a binary classification problem. We were trying to minimize a loss function. There are dozens of ways to do that. I imagine you covered some in the, workshop, in the summer school leading up to this. All right, nothing particularly fancy going on when you have labeled examples from the distribution you're trying to model. However, if you have, uh, there is a notion called a covariate shift. Now we're getting into the transfer learning side of things. Let's imagine that we did know what a new market borrower looked like, but we did not know its labels. We did not know whether they paid or defaulted. There are methods available that will allow you to do this shift and then train a re-weighted model on your original data, where this re-weighting is coming from the ratio of these two distributions. Distribution on the top is the distribution of the new market. Distribution on the bottom is the distribution of your original market. All right. Uh, what's going on behind the scenes, we don't get too many details of this, but we are assuming that the people default in both markets for the same reason. In other words, the conditional probability in market one is the same as the conditional probability of default in the, in the new market. This assumption is what allows this covariate shift or this transfer from one knowledge in market to another market works. That may be an incorrect assumption, and that's what we'll talk about on the very last slide, but it is an assumption we need to make in order to do this shift. However, as I alluded to earlier, not only do we not know the labels of the new market, we don't know the actual features of the new market either. All right, so we can't do the more traditional covariate shift method. We needed to rely on another trick. But what we did have access to was a, a larger set of original market data, not necessarily people who were on the product, and we had a larger set of new market data, not necessarily people who were on the product. So this is represented by these uh, slightly blurry figures behind them. All right. So in total, what we have is actually market data from three different populations. The original market borrowers, the original market population, and the new market population. So let's just look at here a little bit on one of the features called airtime usage. We see that the new market in gray, actually they tend to use less airtime than the original market does. Additionally, original market borrowers, these are the ones who actually uh, transacted on the system, they use air, more airtime than their uh, counterparts in the original market. All right, so we've got these three different populations. We need to combine them in a way that we have a better idea what a new market borrower is going to look like. And this was done actually originally called a three population covariate shift. It uh, was a paper uh, from a few years ago. And so we are using that, tech, that approach in order to do a better credit scoring model in the new market. All right, a second assumption that we need in order for this to work is that borrowers will self-select onto the product for the same reason in both markets. The reason that makes someone borrow, not necessarily default, but the reason that makes someone borrow in the original market is the same reason that they will borrow in the second market. All right, so that's our second of the two assumptions, and we got one more to go yet. All right, so the last thing we do is we build a logistic regression model that compares the original market to the new market. This is what allows us to make the relationship saying what, why we think what we think a new market borrower will look like. The last assumption, and this is probably the nerdiest of the three, is that logistic regression can capture the ratio of two different markets. Uh, for those of you in statistics, we are doing a density, a ratio, ratio density estimation here, and that can be a very tricky area. Right now, we are just using logistic regression, and that may not be the best approach for it. All right, so let's remind ourselves what the three different market assumptions are. One is that people will default in the, same, in the two different markets for the same reasons. That may or may not be true, and I think we'll ask some questions at the end of this of why we think that might change. 
Assumption number two is that people self-select onto the product, that is, they borrow for the same reasons. And that finally, for some mathematical things behind the scenes, logistic regression is able to capture these differences. All right, so now this, uh, I know I went through that fast, but now I wanted to be able to uh, catch us all up on time and talk about these results. So normally when people put results up on the, on the screen, they would assume that their method is the highest one and the best performing, but that's not the case here, all right? So we've got area under the curve. Are we familiar with area under the curve as a measure of how well a model is doing at binary classification? If you were here two years ago, you would, have, you would have be familiar with that. All right. So here we have area under the curve of four different methods that are being used. And I want to actually start on the outside two and then talk about the inside two. The one here we see on the far right, this is what happens if you apply, if we actually used the labels and the distributions of the new market by itself. No transfer learning involved. Of course, we have the best performance. The one on the far left is what would happen if you used the model that was trained on the original market data and applied it directly to the new market. You do not want to do that. It's not going to perform well. That gives us the lowest classification accuracy. All right. Now, our method here at three population covariate shift, that shows the improvement that we were able to gain by using the information of those three different populations. We don't know who's going to borrow, and we certainly don't know whether or not they're going to repay yet because we don't even know if they're going to borrow. But we were still able to make a more accurate model than applying it directly. What we see here at the two population covariate shift is if we knew the features of the new market borrowers but not their labels, that would be the more traditional covariate shift. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that this delta here at B is relatively small. We did a fairly accurate job at predicting who was going to be borrowing in the new market. The gain here at C is very large. That is where you're not doing the transfer learning approaches and you're modeling these relationship directly. What we take away from this is assumption number one that people default for uh, the same reasons in the two different markets is incorrect. People default for very different reasons in the two markets. I can't get into too much detail, but for example, one is uh, much more draconian in how they collect their money back on the system than the other. All right, so one, if you uh, default, uh, the mobile money platform can still come back and take your next income that comes in on the mobile money platform. All right, so that changes the way you think about uh, defaulting on the loan because you're gonna lose the money either way if you wanna use the mobile money platform again. Uh, the second one that uh, people uh, um, would default for different reasons is there's much stronger market economics in terms of credit reference bureaus that are reported to in one of the markets than the other. Right? Eventually, we would like to be able to try to model these dynamics and put that into our credit scoring models as well, but we did not do that on this particular step. The, the, big take, the biggest takeaway from this particular results is the increase that we see going from not doing any transfer learning methods on the original market data to, being have, uh, to using the largers um, before and afters and seeing, doing the three population covariate shifts. So uh, this is the one that we got the best bang for the buck with the least amount of data a priori. All right, so mobile phones are an amazing tool for data collection. I think that was also represented here well, and has potential for increasing financial services in both developed and developing markets. Banks and MNOs have uh, latched on top of mobile money channels and are now offering a lot more financial services on top of these put payments. So this is a, a great space to be in right now. Um, uh, of course, Impesa is the name here, but there are mobile money uh, platforms popping up all over Sub-Saharan Africa. It is important to roll out into new markets. It makes business sense and it helps financial inclusion. But this is difficult. The banks do not know how do we actually take information that we've learned in the first market and build a model that works in an unknown market. This particular work tries to address that specific problem by using a, a larger um, market level data rather than data on specifically on the individual borrowers. All right. Covariate shift in the three popula population covariate shift we did here. This is the first work that we know that have used to address this. We really hope it gets approved upon. Uh, and that goes now to a bit of the science behind things. Logistic regression is probably not the correct way to estimate these ratios. Uh, so that's some, one of the extensions that we'll be looking at a bit more is trying to improve that just purely from a better statistics and data point of view. 
Um, where the work stands right now is uh, we have a, an intern working on this to look at bias. So we, we are very much aware that there's likely bias in these credit scoring models. And that is we perhaps are more likely or less likely to be lending to women, for example, or older women. It's not designed that way, but that's just the data that it's built on. All right, so we are now doing some look at this and seeing at the bias that exists in these models and does the transfer learning approaches we've used increase or decrease that bias. Uh, so that's an area that we're looking at right now. And we are also pivoting out of the consumer credit space and looking more at the SME market. So now what does it mean to have an SME borrowing money on these platforms rather than an individual consumer? Uh, we believe they are more responsible with the money, they are safer credit risks, uh, but they all use the same product right now and so we'd like to be able to differentiate that a bit more and um, increase their credit limits. Um, I believe that's all. So I know I went through that fast, so I, would, I would do hope that there are some questions. Um, do we have four different verticals in the lab? This is the one that's coming out of inclusive financial services. We also have healthcare, government services, and water. So we have projects in each of those spaces. Um, so it is part of our job as the uh, artificial intelligence and data science team is to push each one of those verticals a little bit farther with our knowledge as well as expanding uh, machine learning methods. So it's a really exciting place to be. Uh, in general, we are hiring. This isn't an open call, but we are always looking for uh, more talent in the space. So if you can come track me down later or uh, uh, anyone else here with an IBM badge, it'd be great to talk with you. Thanks.